Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon or good morning, as John said, depending on your time zone. On behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, I welcome you all to today's webinar for the FY23 solicitation for the Body Worn Camera Policy and Implementation Program to support law enforcement agencies. This webinar is being recorded for the benefit of others who may view it later and we posted on our Body Worn Camera website. Please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. We'll address as many questions at the end of the webinar as time allows. General questions not addressed will be responded to and shared. Following the webinar, you will receive a request to evaluate it. Please complete the evaluation and give us your honest thoughts and recommendations. Thank you again for joining, and John, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you all for attending, and I'll start off with an apology. We were anxious to get this webinar out there fairly early in the grant cycle, so we inadvertently scheduled it for a holiday, and then um, by the time we realized that we already had a good number of registrants, so we decided to go ahead with it. I appreciate those of you who uh, have taken the time to be here today and maybe come in on your day off or called in on your day off. Hope we make it worth it to you. This presentation will be recorded and made available, and we will follow up with questions and answers, and slide deck will also be made available. Let me go back to the previous slide here. So this is the 2023 Body Worn Camera Solicitation from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We'll walk through the application process today. I just wanna make a clarification from the start. Since 2020, BWC, the Body Worn Camera Program run by BJA has had two solicitations. This is the standard Body Worn Camera Policy and Implementation Program for law enforcement agencies, better known as BWC PIP. It's the focus of this webinar. In 2020, we had started a micro-grant program specifically for supporting small, rural, and tribal agencies. It's a bit of a streamlined program tailored around those agencies. If you do fit those criteria, which is essentially any agency 50 or fewer sworn, some agencies, including sheriff's departments that might be larger than that, that serve rural jurisdiction or federally recognized tribes. You can apply for that grant. We expect that to be re-released in the fall of 2023. If you are not successful in this grant or you're still waiting to hear from this for this grant, uh, you can apply for that grant and this one as well. If you're awarded both, uh, we sort that out later. So just to let you know about that, there's a website there where you can learn more about the small rural and tribal micro grant program. So I'll get into the meat of our discussion today. I want to first give you an overview of what the Office of Justice Programs is, the umbrella agency under which the Bureau of Justice Assistance sits. It's the principal agency within the Department of Justice that provides for grant funding, training, research, and statistics for the criminal justice community. It's one of three grant-making agencies, the others being the Office of Violence Against Women, OVW, and the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services. Some of you may be familiar with the COPS Office for their hiring grants. So under OJP, there's the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which I represent. Uh, we're the largest grant-making agency. There's the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the National Institute of Justice, which is the science wing, as I mentioned. Or there's the Office of Victims of Crime and the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, all of which are grant-making agencies. And there's also the SMART Office, which is the Office for Sex Offender Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehending, and Registering, and Tracking. So that's just a little bit of the background. Our mission at BJA is really to provide the leadership in services in grant administration, criminal justice policy development, to help enable communities, to ensure public safety, to help achieve safe communities. We work with communities, governments at the state and local level, nonprofit organizations towards reducing crime and recidivism, ending unnecessary confinement, and generally promoting safe and fair criminal justice systems throughout the country. Our director is Carlton Moore. He's been with the office for about a year. 
She had previously served in the state administrating agency for the state of Ohio. Uh, within CJA, we have several offices. The policy office in which I sit, uh, we essentially provide leadership to criminal justice organizations. We develop uh, sort of the operational aspects, the substantive aspects of grant programs based on federal appropriations language and some of our own discretion. We have the programs office, which really provides the tremendous amount of administrative and technical support. They will manage the grants and the finances uh, should you be awarded. The operations office, which works with us on communications, formulates budgets, works with Congress, and the Office of Legislative Affairs and making sure that we're staying on track with what the appropriations and what Congress intend for us to do. And then there's the Public Safety Officers Benefits Office that provides benefits and services to fallen first responders, firefighters, public safety officers, police officers, which is part of the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We invest in different funding streams to accomplish our goals. So this program is one of those funding streams. Uh, we educate our TTA provider who's uh, hosting the webinar is with us today. Uh, they help us with the research and development and delivery of what works with body-worn cameras and then in other grant areas. We serve to equip. So we create tools and products and build capacity to improve outcomes. So with this grant program, we're fostering the use of body-worn cameras and the use of digital evidence to improve practice, and we partner and consult. We work with you all as you become grantees to move the field forward in essence. Here is, again, the title of our presentation. Important to note at the beginning that there are two deadlines. April 4th is the grants.gov deadline at 8.59 p.m., not midnight, and I just realized the typo. Please note that it's the Just Grants deadline is April 11th, 2023, also at 8.59 p.m. I think that was a carryover from previous year's slide. When we send this out, we'll correct that. So please take a note of that. Those of you who know the grant program uh, know that we started in 2015, and we have basically have provided site-based awards to law enforcement agencies that are seeking to implement body-worn cameras. In 2022, we specified uh, the grantees a little bit differently and we expanded the program, so to speak. We created a separate, separate category for site-based awards to state and territorial correctional agencies. They've always been eligible provided they provide law enforcement services, but we decided to treat them as a separate category and beginning in 2022. And then because many agencies are already establishing body-worn camera programs, we wanted to provide funding to assist those agencies that already had body-worn camera programs, but we're looking to expand and refine what they're doing with those programs, specifically how they're using digital evidence management and body-worn camera footage to enhance their operations. So we have three funding categories for demonstrations of for agencies that have, that have established body-worn camera programs. Briefly, it's for digital evidence management and integration, for optimizing the BWC footage, the use of footage, the management of footage by prosecutor's offices, and then using BWC footage, basically an agency using its own BWC footage for training purposes and to promote constitutional policing. And we'll drill down a little bit on what those mean today. Um, but it's all laid out in detail in the solicitation itself. Eligibility for category one, those that for body-worn cameras and law enforcement agencies, it's two law enforcement agencies, including those that may be initiating uh, body-worn cameras on behalf of themselves and other agencies, partnership agencies. So it uh, could be a state police organization or a state administrating agency. Could be units of local government, typically municipal or county law enforcement agencies. Could be federally recognized Indian tribes that perform law enforcement functions, basically uh, law enforcement agencies operating at the tribal level. And then public agencies that are units of local government, combination of states or units 
or any department or agency or in instrumentality of the foregoing. That's a mouthful. Uh, we'll give some examples as we proceed. Agencies that have fund been funded under that rubric in the past. Here are some examples. State, municipal, and county law enforcement agencies have applied. County sheriffs have applied. And a whole host of other publicly funded LEAs, law enforcement agencies. I stress publicly funded, privately funded law enforcement agencies are not eligible uh, based on the appropriations language. We've funded tribal police in the past. There's been a, there's a name of several of the probably at least eight or nine tribal law enforcement agencies that we funded under this program. Uh, we often fund university and college law enforcement agencies. Again, these are publicly funded universities and college. Towson University in Maryland, Springfield Technical College in Massachusetts, and the Southeast Missouri State University are just a few that we funded. Uh, we also fund special jurisdictional agencies, often operating at the state or local level. Fish and Wildlife Police, uh, Independent School District Police, and so forth have been funded in the past. For partnership examples, we fund state administrating agencies, such as the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, which has uh, been awarded in, in several iterations. Uh, they, um, they bring in two or three dozen agencies as sub-awardees. They help manage their grants and their progress. They act as the primary agency, and they provide sub-grants to, in, in any given year, it's been between 2,000 and as many as 50 uh, law enforcement agencies. Last year, we had the Rhode Island Department of Public Safety come in, applying on behalf of the state police and about a dozen smaller agencies. In the past, we've had a organization called the, the Regional Justice Information Service, Regis, that operates in and around the St. Louis, Missouri area. They're basically an information sharing entity that is instrumentality of law enforcement agencies that so they've applied on behalf of anywhere from eight to 20, I think in, in a couple different uh, years. And then uh, we have a lot of agencies that will come in on behalf of themselves and bring in often smaller agencies within their jurisdiction, sometimes within the same county. So several years ago, the city of La Crosse, Wisconsin applied for itself, as well as some sub-grantees, which were law enforcement agencies operating in the vicinity. I think they're all in the same county, and it included a uh, tribal law enforcement agency, the Ho-Chunk National Tribal Police. So we like to see that um, it's an economy of scale. It brings more grantees into the mix, sub-grantees. If you're looking to partner, uh, we certainly would encourage that. Eligibility for Category 2, these are site-based awards to state and territorial correctional agencies. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory for deploying BWCs in one or more correctional facilities and or deploying BWCs for community corrections, for instance, for parole officers. This category is only for state and territory level agencies. Jail, particularly sheriff's department that wants to apply for use of body-worn cameras in your jail, you should apply under Category 1 as a, sort of a traditional law enforcement agency. I think we've had about six or seven state correctional agencies apply since the inception. Or, I'm sorry, we've had more apply. We've had about six or seven be awarded since the inception of the Body Worn Camera Program in 2015. Those are a few of them. I know Georgia Department of Corrections is another one. We also have demonstration grants, which are categories three, four, and five. That term is probably not self-defining, but it's really a program where an agency has moved the needle on some type of a program, in this case, a body-worn camera program. They're able to showcase how they've done that and share that for the benefit of other agencies. Here's more detail on our demonstration project. Again, remember that categories one and two are essentially for the acquisition of body-worn cameras, certainly full programs but uh, they're predicated on the fact that you're going to be buying or leasing body-worn cameras for these demonstration projects. These are agencies that already have established body-worn camera programs that are looking to do one of three things. 
promotes digital evidence management and integration. So they support existing or proposed digital evidence integration demonstration efforts in any law enforcement agency, prosecutorial agencies, or partnerships between such agencies. Category four may overlap a little bit operationally, but it's really specific to prosecutors' offices that are seeking to optimize uh, the use of body-worn cameras in decision-making to better interpret what information they're getting from law enforcement agencies, let's say, in the county where a state attorney general from agencies in the state to more efficiently use digital evidence for decision-making for adjudication, adjudicating cases or looking at instances of police misconduct uh, that prosecutors often do. So this is the second year we've instituted that award. I'll have some examples later that can point you to looking on our uh, funding website about agencies that have been funded in the past for categories three, four, and five. And then category five is essentially an agency using its own BWC footage for training purposes and constitutional policing demonstration projects. That could be things like promoting community outreach efforts, improving officer performance, doing things like de-escalation training, advancing community policing or constitutional policing. Uh, I know that not funded by us, but for this program, uh, funded for us in the past for body-worn cameras, Los Angeles Police Department has public-facing videos and presentations about public disclosures of critical incidents, including officer-involved shootings, that they do routinely as a way to provide and educate the community on those types of events in a timely manner. So programs like that would be supported under Category 5. Here are some of the examples I spoke about. In small print are the grant numbers uh, that you can search on the BJA's website. I'll provide a link to that later, but these are some of the examples. Uh, the LAPD is doing a digital management and integration project. Fairfax County, Virginia is doing a project to enhance how it shares its data with neighboring agencies and with the prosecutor's office. A couple of prosecutor's offices in Orange County, California and Broward County uh, with 2022 funds are engaged in a demonstration project that showcases how they're using BWC footage more efficiently in decision making. And then for categories four, uh, we have examples from Rochester, New York. They're using BWC footage for basically training and improvements in constitutional policing and the, the police department for the city of New York homeless services is using BWC footage and assessing it, using it to assess their and, and improve their interactions with the homeless population in New York City and in some of the homeless shelters and facilities. So uh, for those of you who are considering those categories, uh, these would be programs to look up on BJA's website to get an understanding through project abstracts of what they're doing. In summary, for categories one and two, again, these are programs for agencies seeking to establish or expand comprehensive body-worn camera programs through the acquisition of body-worn cameras. For these programs, you must propose to purchase or lease body-worn cameras. We'll get into how that, what that means in context or operationally in a few minutes. But it's important, while it is predicated on purchase of body-worn cameras, it's not just an equipment purchase program. It's not we're providing money for you to make purchases uh, as an applicant. And as, if you're awarded, you're expected to commit to a comprehensive and deliberate BWC policy development process that seeks broad stakeholder input. We make accommodations for those of you who already have policy and who may be expanding your program. In addition to that, applicants should describe their deliberate plan for deploying body-worn cameras and implementing that comprehensive program. They should also describe the specific ways that body-worn cameras will be used to enhance their agency mission, improving evidence collection, improving accountability and transparency and so forth. And you should also describe how you plan to, what your capacities are for managing the tremendous amounts of digital evidence that come from body-worn cameras, including how you will share that information 
for public records requests coming from citizens, media, and so forth. You should know, you know, you're going to get money for body-worn cameras. So you should tell us the deliberate and planful ways that you would implement the program, the body-worn cameras in a comprehensive program, or if you're expanding your program, how you're doing that and how the additional cameras, the expansion of your camera program will fulfill those goals. The types of programs supported under categories one and two, I've alluded to this before, generally they're initial and expansive implementation programs. So it may be an agency looking to implement a body-worn camera program for the 80 officers that have regular contact with the public uh, patrol officers. Sometimes agencies look to deploy across the department, uh, including command staff, that's fine. We do allow pilot implementations. These are less common. They were common in the early days of this program, 2015, 16, and 17, where agencies might have tried body-worn cameras out for maybe 25 officers or one of their 15 precincts, sort of as a trial balloon. Those are permissible. And increasingly, we're getting applications for program expansion maybe an agency that deploys all patrol officers, and now they're looking to expand the pool of officers that will have access, that will use body-worn cameras to include, let's say, first-line supervisors, sergeants and lieutenants who often go out in the field. Uh, LAPD several years ago applied to expand their program beyond their patrol officers and first-line supervisors to include their transit officers, the officers who work transit detail who had not to that point use body-worn cameras. So all those are permissible. Uh, we're very flexible. We know that it's a dynamic and emerging body-worn camera ecosystem out there. People, agencies are using them in new and innovative ways, school resource officers. So we accommodate all those issues, all those situations with this grant program. And I'm sorry some of the slides got cut off here in translation, a little bit of the title. But the objectives and deliverables for Category 2 is, you know, essentially, you should describe the BWC technology you intend to deploy, how it will be used in evidence-based and problem-solving approaches. Critically, you should implement a body-worn camera that addresses the best use of those cameras, the relevant state laws, privacy rights, release of video to the public. You do not have to have a policy or provide a policy draft to apply, but you need to commit to having a policy in place if, as you implement the program. And I'll get into a little more details. And in general, your BWC program should be planned and should be presented as a planned and phased approach that achieves you know, input, input from both internal and external stakeholders. The union probably should be consulted if you're applying for a grant or you should commit to working with them in implementing the body worn camera program. Increasingly, states are mandating them, so you should be aware of what your state does in terms of mandates, or in some states, if you, they don't mandate body worn cameras, but if you have body worn cameras, there may be cert, certain policy elements that are required in the state or are binding in the state. Continuing on the objectives and deliverables for categories one and two, it should be an implementation of operational procedures and tracking mechanisms. You know, how do you how will you review the footage? How will you store it? How will you retain it? How you engage in redaction, the blurring of faces when privacy needs to be assured, and how you go about deleting digital evidence media when necessary. You should address training, not just how to use the cameras, but you know, how they train the policy, <coughs> training the state law. And then as I alluded to, you should address how you're going to share that BWC footage with agency personnel, with prosecutors, criminal justice stakeholders, the community, and in the event of uh, media requests with the media. You don't need to dive into details, but to be competitive, you should really address those elements of your planned BWC program. Here's the important elements to understand as we start to talk about budget here. In order to distribute funds, we put a cap of funding on the federal side of $2,000 per camera, and this applies only to categories one and two. Remember, this is where the lease or purchase of body-worn cameras 
is required. So that doesn't mean, and those of you who know body more cameras know that they seldom cost $2,000 per camera, particularly if you're purchasing the cameras outright as opposed to leasing them. The formula is just to cover a variety of expenses and it's also to assure that the money is equitably distributed. We, have, we wanted to put a cap per camera on the awards. The total cost of the program is what you request for your BWC funding and the matching requirements, both of which we'll drill down to a little bit. The absolute cap on awards here is $2 million. And then, uh, as I mentioned, is what's called a 50% funding match. That tends to be a little confusing. It doesn't mean that you match 50 cents on the dollar. It means that of the total grant package, half of that to be federal matching. So there's a dollar to dollar match of federal funds to applicant funds. And that'll become much clearer as I go through some examples here. This is just a little bit of the examples I used about broad scale programs, but within the context of the $2,000 per body worn camera funding cap. Uh, it may be clear to you, but I just wanna make it abundantly clear with these examples. So let's suppose there's a municipal agency with 100 full-time officers that proposes to get 80 body-worn cameras, 70 for patrol officers, 10 for first-line supervisors. So that's 80 cameras total under the $2,000 per body-worn camera funding cap. The applicant can apply for, ask for, no more than $160,000 in federal funding, 80 times 2,000. Um, similar situation with a state correctional agency, they look, they're maybe looking to deploy cameras in two of their 10 facilities. This is true to form. We've had agencies do similar things in the past. So they're requiring 100 body-worn cameras to be used in correct, by correctional officers in those two facilities under the $2,000 per BWC funding metric. This agency can apply for up to $200,000. You don't have to ask for the full amount, uh, agencies can use up to that amount. Some of that, will, again, will become a little clearer in some of the examples I will provide. Agencies are, again, uh, required for matching under categories one, body-worn camera programs for law enforcement agencies in category two, so correctional agencies. When you match funds, you're required to fill those matching obligations just as you are federal obligations. So if you propose to do a, a and C and you're funding whatever A is with federal funds, you can't just say, oh, we wanted to do B and C, we're going to use matching funds, but we didn't get around to it or we changed our mind. You will be held accountable for that. Uh, you should be cautious about overmatching. So again, if you let's say you have a $200,000 federal request, you have to match with at least $200,000. Sometimes agencies like to match with a lot of things feeling it makes them more competitive, but just keep in mind, the more that you add on to it, the more that you're gonna be held liable to because you have to fulfill the matching obligation in the same way that you need to fulfill the federal obligation. So some of that will become clear when I give some budget examples. All the expenses must be re reasonably related to the body-worn camera program. So you can't say, well, we're gonna buy 50 programs and then 50 body-worn cameras and then we're going to also purchase two new vehicles for officers to ride around in while they're wearing the body worn camera. That doesn't really pass the giggle test, so to speak. So we understand that the body worn cameras are integrated with other equipment and we give a lot of leeway to what you can include, but it needs to be reasonable. And federal and matching funds that need not reflect the full cost of the program. So let's say you're getting 100 cameras that would top you out at $200,000 in federal funds. You would match with two, at least $200,000, but you may know that, you know, defining your, your program broadly and considering outreach and responding to public records requests that you might think that in, in the three-year grant program that the full cost will cost you $600,000, but you're only applying to offset the cost of $400,000 between $200,000 in the federal grant and $200,000 in the matching grant. Hopefully that'll become clearer as I get to some examples in a moment. 
Federal funds may not cover more than 50% of your match. Again, sort of that one-to-one -one match. You, know, you must identify the source of the other 50%, the non-federal portion, and that amounts to the total cost of your grant. You may, you know, often you use your own local funds for that. You may match with state funds should those be provided. Increasingly, states are providing funding for body-worn cameras or other types of equipment. So uh, it's possible that you can match with state funds if your local agency obviously can. If you're a state agency applying, what can't be done by and large is that applicants can't use other forms of federal funding for their match against federal funding. So um, you, can't, you cannot use burn JAG funds or COVID relief funds or American Rescue Plan funds as your local match. Again, this reiterates the point uh, that if you exceed the required match and we approve your budget, which we, you know, we tend to do, we're not gonna get back to you and say you overmatched. Uh, the total match amount incorporated into the approved budget becomes mandatory and subject to audit. So again, a caution about uh, overmatching or doing excessive overmatching. And these are points I made before. Matching is restricted to the same use of the funds as well with federal funds. An applicant can satisfy the match requirement with either, with either cash, what's called cash contributions or in-kind contributions of goods and services. I won't get into that. It's spelled out in a little more detail in the grant solicitation and then in much more detail in uh, the grant financial guidance, uh, which there are links in the solicitation itself. Just gonna take a breather here. I think we're doing all right on time. And this is again, uh, I'm drilling down into budget here because that tends to be the most challenging thing for lots of agencies. Uh, match can be a cash match, which is hard cash, um, cash spent for project related costs. What some agencies do, and I'm not recommending this, but sometimes they're really focus on the purchase of cameras and they consider all the other types of things that go along with that, the training, the policy development to sort of be funneled in with what they're going to do as part of the grant. So they don't explicitly budget for that. So some agencies just say, may just say, we're gonna get, we're, we're looking to purchase 50 cameras. We'll use federal funds for 25 of those cameras and matching funds for the other 25 that's permissible, but you also may use that $2,000 per camera on the federal side and the equivalent matching or more comprehensive elements of the expenditures you plan to spend for your body worn camera program. In kind match is sometimes called soft match, but it includes, but, but and it's not limited to the valuation of non cash contributions. These may be in the form of services, supplies, or equipment. So it could be, for instance, that you're implementing a body-worn camera program and you may be hiring new personnel to manage that program, sworn personnel, civilian personnel, or you may be allocating a portion of an existing sergeant's or lieutenant's time or captain's time to manage that program. Uh, that, those will be examples of in-kind match. Again, spelled out much more in much more detail. We focused in on categories one and two. For categories three and four, there is no match. Uh, we're not, these aren't equipment purchase grants per se, but we do recognize that if you're doing a demonstration that equipment purchases and service contracts will be allowable, but they're not the primary purpose of these grants. So if you might get extra body-worn cameras that are sort of incidental to the program or helping you push forward the program. But if you're funding, looking for categories, uh, funding in categories three to five, we're not expecting you to essentially be establishing or expanding your body worn camera acquisition. We're looking to you, for you to improve your program. So we limit some of the costs. You can purchase at least PWC equipment, but that should be no more than 15% of the project total. Let's say you're a large agency and you want to get 10 additional body worn cameras for supervisory personnel so they can understand how they work, but you're proposing a much larger constitutional policing demonstration project. That would be under category five. Now, we want to allow you also to 
purchase software or contract with vendors for services such as digital information sharing or digital, digital evidence integration and management, but that should be no more than 25% of the total. Again, this is we're not really providing money for you to buy something, the equipment or the services you buy are sort of incidental to you showcasing what you're doing. So in this example, let's say that we're funding under category four, a prosecutor's office for improving their use of digital evidence and body-worn camera footage, they may use that portion of the funding to purchase additional licenses for whatever, let's say, um, vendor that their local police departments are using. Sometimes they bundle things in a way that basically it'd be a cloud storage situation in which the police would be, the police agencies within the county might be storing data on the server and then the prosecutors can get access to that data um, instead of having it transferred over on disk or or sent sent as files from the police department. So it's sort of the way the field is evolving. I'll stop getting uh, into too much detail there. For categories three, four, and five, again, the demonstration projects, no federal award may exceed $1 million. As I alluded to before, there's no requirement to acquire a PWC, but if you do, the cost associated with those BWCs should not be more than 200 per camera on that portion of the award and no more than 15% of the federal funding request. So if you were to request a million dollars, you know, that type of equipment should be no more than $150,000 in total. And again, uh, there's no matching requirement for categories three, four, and five. These are demonstration programs. So that makes them distinct from acquisition, equipment acquisition programs. Okay, allowable cost for federal funds is generally applied across all categories. Um, they can be used for the purchase, licensing, or contracts of BWCs or the leases. It can be used for related equipment and equipment upgrades. Uh, it could be the mounts for body-worn cameras, the decks uh, in which body-worn cameras are placed to upload them at the end of shift. It could be for training for officers. It could be for salary uh, support personnel, be that existing personnel or new personnel. Uh, it could be for community outreach efforts. It could be for research and evaluation. There is no requirement for research and evaluation in the body worn camera program, but sometimes agencies include that. Maybe may working with a local university to optimize their implementation or study the, their implementation of body-worn cameras. And importantly, it can be used for digital evidence and media storage, either on-premise storage and server or cloud storage services. Uh, in the past, um, the appropriations language, the accompanying language that came with appropriations put limitations on the use of funds for digital media storage, I think has changed because uh, it's increasingly been recognized that the cost driver in a lot of body-worn camera programs, particularly as we're moving towards from purchase to leases, are the digital evidence storage and acquisition which sort of bundled together. Um, the data is stored, you're given access to it, you're, you're allowed to manage it, and that's a big cost driver. So uh, we didn't want to tie agencies' hands or limit uh, their use of funding for that. So uh, luckily the appropriators uh, went along with that in starting it several years ago. Um, so here are some examples that were long promised. This is very simplified budget uh, just for illustration purposes. Uh, I would say that uh, agency is proposing to get 100 cameras. They're projecting the cost to be $900 each. So that's $90,000 is the total. There's a $300 licensing fee, so that's another $30,000 uh, for the 100 body-worn cameras. They're going to hire a manager at 50% full-time equivalent for $50,000 and spend $30,000 on training. What, that's what they propose on the federal side. And then on the match side, there'll be other services listed, including 
a docking system, a server upgrade that's needed, and then specific training on digital evidence management. So um, you're, you're really given a lot of flexibility in how you allocate your budget on the federal funding side and the match side. This is just one example. Here is uh, some of the key things. This is consistent with the $200,000. You're going at the max of the $200,000 per camera, even though the camera didn't cost $2,000 each per se. Uh, and then you're matching, uh, you're needing the match to dollar for dollar match. Another simplified budget for categories one and two, a smaller agency proposing federal funds funding expenditures for 25 cameras that projecting the cost to be $500 each. So that's uh, $12,050, $500 there. Um, they're paying $300 for licensing fees for $7,500 total. And then they're supposed to go to a regional uh, meeting, let's say at the state level, um, spending a couple people there for $3,000. Uh, that's a $23,000 match. They're not getting any personnel. The say the agency can propose um, to match with cameras. Um, again, I'm proposing to use matching funds for 29 cameras and a licensing fees. So they're matching the $23,000 in federal expenditures with approximately the same amount in local expenditures and essentially funding the body-worn cameras and licensing and, and, and travel, but basically the body-worn cameras matching reasonable, and they're not overmatching to any extent, uh, slight overmatch here. Uh, so they're getting 54 cameras and the $23,000 is well under the funding cap with uh, the 54 cameras, they would have been eligible to apply for $108,000 in federal funding but they chose not to um, basically, I think the assumption is that they'll be doing all those other things like training, like policy development with their own funds and they're not integrating that into their budget. Outline that information in their project descriptions. Um, so I mentioned that um, policy is central. As the program has evolved, we've had to do less handholding in having agencies develop policy simply because more states are stepping forward and providing guidelines or you know, mandating certain elements of body-worn camera policies and just uh, more agencies that have done that and more examples out there. Uh, having said that, we want to be able to meet you where you're at. So we do have our training, technical assistance, tech training and technical assistance provider that will help you with your policy development, certainly to the extent that you need it and to make sure that you um, achieve the goal of having a comprehensive and deliberate policy through something called the BWC TIP scorecard, which is a link is provided in the, solic in the solicitation, particularly for agencies that already have established their body-worn camera programs, they may be expanding. We do allow for agency self-certification um, that tracks with the scorecard, and it's a checklist that helps us ensure that your policy is deliberate and comprehensive. We do not, again, require policies to be submitted at the time of application. You may just be proposing to get body-worn cameras for the first time and haven't come up with a policy. You may uh, be waiting for the assistance of the technical assistance provider to do that or just um, you know, moving forward with policy, should you be awarded for this program, that's fine. Uh, if you want to include policies and draft policies, that's fine as well, but they are not required. There are examples, but there are links to the certification and the scorecard again in the solicitation, so you can see what those are about. Policy is important. It has been since the outset of this grant program. Um, so we're looking to support development of policies or make sure policies in place are in place that are deliberate, comprehensive, partnership-based, reflective of public safety, stakeholder input, both internally, like I said, um, unions, command staff, maybe your IT staff, as well as uh, community and certainly the prosecutors who will be receiving BWC footage. 
for categories one and two, policy development is essentially mandatory. You need to have a, should have a policy in place before you purchase and deploy your camera. So we will hold 90% of your grant funds until that policy condition is met. And the TTA provider uh, will, you know, should you be awarded, contacts you early and works with you, um, sort of meets you where you're at with your policy development needs and provides the assistance needed. For categories three, four, and five, we expect since you have an established body worn camera program that's been running and operating successfully, that you already have a policy in place. So we just require you to complete the certification form early in the process. And again, uh, that can be done in collaboration with the training and technical assistance provider. Purposely didn't get into a lot of detail, but our training, training and technical assistance providers, CNA, is on the call today, and they really work with you hand in hand and work through the policy element. They help onboard you into the sort of BWC PIP family of practitioners, so to speak, and they do a great job of outreach and working with you. So besides policy development, they provide all sorts of other types of technical assistance. They help showcase and identify promising practices and, and best practices, uh, peer engagement. Um, they will provide a host of um, webinars and other knowledge projects. They'll help you reach out to your community um, to do specialized training for your agency as needed. So uh, at the outset of, your, of the award, should your agency apply and be awarded, you will have a uh, training technical assistance point of contact and team assigned by our a provider against CNA. They maintain a website. They provide content for our BWC toolkit. It's basically a resource toolkit. They will distribute newsletters, webinars, and develop other knowledge products. They basically help build a community practice by supporting peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, webinars, and listening sessions. They'll host an annual meeting that a grantees will attend to sort of learn about uh, more about the body worn camera program and to share experiences. And here's where the community practice comes into place. A lot of our past grantees have become leaders in the field of body worn cameras, policy and program implementation. And we use those individuals as resources for our webinars, for our national meetings and so forth. Um, some of you may not be on the call, on this call, looking, looking to expand your program may be part of that community of practice already. Okay, here we're kind of winding, hopefully in the home stretch here. So these are things that BWC applications, indeed any application through the Office of Justice Programs or BJA must include. There's the application for federal assistance known as the SF-424, the disclosure of lobbying activities, standard form LLL, uh, these two elements need to be submitted in grants.gov and sort of the first stage of your application process. We'll get into that a little bit in a few slides. And then in Just Grants, uh, you will provide a proposal abstract now in Just Grants that's ingested into Just Grants. Uh, in our previous grant management system, that was an attachment. You will provide a proposal narrative. We'll talk about the details in the format of that in a moment. That will be an attachment in Just Grant. You'll do a budget detail worksheet and budget narrative online again in Just Grant. Previously, we had budget narratives submitted as attachments, uh, but now it's part of the Just Grant system. You'll complete uh, a financial management system with internal controls questionnaires. So that's a required element. Uh, you should include disclosure of pending applications. If you are applying, let's say, for a state grant concurrent with this grant, uh, you should mention that in an attachment that disclose, basically disclosing you have other pending applications for a similar project. It's also good to put that in your project narrative as well. If you're applying for, on behalf of yourself and other agencies, or you're an agency like the Regis, Regional Justice Information Sharing Entity in 
Missouri, you should provide a list of sub recipient agencies who will be included as sub awardees. These are things that uh, probably should have been clear here is these are things that should be included if applicable. Oftentimes, law enforcement agencies don't use indirect cost rate agreements that tend to be used for non by nonprofit organizations and universities who apply for federal grants, and it's the way that they account for overhead. Um, we're certainly not prohibited from using indirect, indirect cost rates, and we sometimes get these from university police departments, um, so that is permissible. And if you're claiming indirect costs, essentially costs to cover overhead and services that your institution will be using and administering, administrating the grant, you need to have a active indirect cost rate agreement with some federal entity. Could be Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, but uh, that needs to be current. Again, that's spelled out more in the grants financial management guidance. If you're doing research, you have research and evaluation, independence and integrity, and form completed a letter from your research partner. If you're a tribe, tribal authorizing resolution should be included. Again, for researchers, you should have authentication of research evaluation, independence, and integrity. And it, you know, if you're just assessing your own body-worn camera programs internally, the research elements aren't needed. That's if you're doing formal research. Let's say you're doing a formal evaluation of your body-worn camera program and you're bringing in a university or contracting with researchers to do that, you should include those forms. That's not if you're just going to do sort of normal routine internal assessments of the impact of your body-worn camera program. Other things that should be included, and so should, not must, are screening sheets. Essentially, for those of you who are new to the grant process, I strongly recommend these are in the solicitation. It essentially walks you through the match requirements, the $2,000 per camera metric, and then sort of alerts you to the fact of what you would commit to be doing and for the course of the grant should you be awarded uh, to make making sure that you go in there with your eyes wide open as to what the requirements are for federal grants. You know, we're not uh, just giving the, this money to you and then allowing you to spend it. And, you, you know, we need to show accountability. Um, you need to work with us to help us understand how the grants impacting your, prog your program and your operations. So uh, these screening sheets sort of help you sort that out. Uh, there's one for a single agency applying on its own behalf, and then one for partnership agencies uh, that allows you to list the other agencies that might be subgrantees. And then if you are bringing on subgrantees, uh, you should have an MOU or a letter of support from the subrecipient agency just to let us know that they will be on board should you be funded. Occasionally, we'll have larger entities like the state administrating agency that will may name some agencies or may not name agencies, but they have a plan to bring them on, like the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. So uh, that's fine. Uh, that would need to be spelled out in the proposal narrative and provide and, per, and some details provided about how you're going to go about that. The proposal narrative is obviously important. This is where uh, you're writing a grant and providing the justification why you need body-worn cameras, the context. So we limit you to 15 pages, double space, you know, use a 12-point standard font, New Times Roman is preferred, one-inch margins, uh, kind of reminds you probably of doing term papers in high school or college. I would highly recommend the use of the sections and uh, keeping your, in, using subtitles to keep the text organized and readable. Um, attachments do not count against the page limit. So you may be attaching, for instance, personnel, uh, resumes for personnel, job descriptions for personnel, that's fine. Uh, you don't have to ingest all that in the project narrative. You know, there may be other things. You may have a policy that you've already developed that you will provide as an attachment. Uh, that's fine, it won't, doesn't count against your 15 page narrative. But again, just closely follow the format 
just keep in mind that this is a competitive grant program. So peer reviewers who are looking at this would much rather have a 15 page document that's nicely organized with sections and subtitles um, so they can follow uh, how well you're meeting the criteria of the grant, the scoring criteria of the grant, rather than reading 15 pages of undifferentiated text it makes it harder for them. You may write a really good proposal, but it may suffer if uh, the peer reviewers have to sort through it and figure out where things are. So organizing it according to the scoring criteria, which we'll discuss momentarily, and the titles is critical. Here are the sections that are most critical and tied to scoring. So a description of the issue, and essentially, do you have a body-worn camera program? Are you a new body-worn camera program? Why do you need them? You know, maybe the state's mandating them, but you should express uh, what you think the value is of the body-worn cameras on their own and over and above the fact that the state may be now mandating that you acquire body-worn cameras. And it's happened in about eight states to date. So you should have a project design and implementation. How are you gonna go about implementing the body-worn camera expanding or expanding your body-worn camera? You should discuss the capabilities and competencies of the organization, your organization and its personnel. Uh, how are you gonna collect the data that's required, basically, you, you'll be reporting information on implementing your body warrant camera and the impact it's had on your agency. And uh, you should have some sort of plan for continuing the, pro continuing the program after the federal funds have been expended. This is a three-year grant program. So we want to know at the end of three years, you're not just going to drop the body warrant camera program that you and the federal government have invested in and leave it at that. We want to some assurances that you're going to continue building off and benefiting from the expenditure of the federal funds and your own match funds. The budget, again, use the provided budget form in just grants. There's allowance in there to provide narrative as to you know, why you're spending, what you're spending. Here's some important notes. You know, I know that many of you who do not have body worn camera programs are exploring and looking at the vendors. That's fine, but that's really considered only for reference purposes. If you provide a vendor quote that does not qualify as a budget with just grants, uh, you can't get through the submission process without at least entering something into the budget form. In the past, we've had some people who, when the budget was attached in a separate document, they simply attached a vendor quote, and that doesn't cut it. The budget submitted as part, part of the application is considered a cost estimate and even if you attach a vendor quote and you include, you complete the budget using that vendor quote, it doesn't imply that we accept that vendor quote or indeed that we say that, hey, we're selecting you because you chose vendor X and we'll get into that momentarily. Important elements for successful applications. So, you know, economies of scale are always good. Partnership, shared resources, shared contact. Uh, you should be attentive to the technical considerations and body-worn cameras, particularly how they've evolved since 2015. There is a market survey that our colleagues at the National Institute of Justice did in 2016. It's a bit out of date, but there's a lot of material out there about body-worn cameras and their functional capabilities that you should express some awareness of providing a justification for how those particular features and, and body, what the needs, what the body one camera needs are, particularly your agency. You'll be more successful if you indicate that you reached out to partners, particularly prosecutors, but going beyond that, a lot of successful applicants talk about how they reach out to community groups or to institutions, be they um, schools, churches, businesses that might be affected by body worn cameras. Letters of support from prosecutors are beneficial. They're not mandatory. Uh, you should address officer concerns, officer safety, and officer buy-in. How are you going to leverage body-worn cameras to achieve those? How are body-worn cameras going to improve your agency's mission and outcome efficiency, improving evidentiary outcomes and decision-making, assuring body-worn camera training so they're properly implemented and so forth? Um, and you know, to the extent that you can, 
uh, demonstrate a commitment to evidence-based practices in a way that you plan to deploy your body work cameras or if it's an expansion program, how you've deployed them. Uh, here's um, going back to the sections I talked about before, description of the issue when these applications are being peer reviewed, that will account for 10% of your score, basically the weight of your score. Uh, the project design and implementation will be 35% um, your organization's capacities and competencies. How well you describe those will account for 25% the plan for collecting the required performance measures would be 10% and the budget that's reasonable, you know, it applies to what the allocation is for things that are clearly related to the body worn camera program. That constellation of budget factors uh, will be 20% of the weight of your score. Consider that when you're writing your applications. The continuity for the program was not included in the standard template in 2023. But I think if you, you know, you would do well to mention the fact that, you know, once the federal funds are expended, you should mention how you will support and continue the body worn camera program, be that with general funds, maybe state funds, so forth. You know, we want to be more competitive and you'll come off as having a more comprehensive program plan if you indicate that you intend to continue the program after the grant fund, after the grant period. Um, it should go without saying um, that that's important for us to us. Okay, so the major takeaways, and I appreciate your patience. I've gone through a lot of stuff. Is this is a competitive grant solicitation program? It's not just an equipment program for categories one and two. Very important, and uh, grant funds cannot be used to pay for DWCs you already bought, contracted for, or budgeted before receiving and accepting your grant. That's called supplanting. Unfortunately, sometimes agencies will apply and they'll go ahead and say, well, we're going to buy the body worn cameras and just use our grant funds to pay ourselves back should we get the grant funds. Unfortunately, that's not allowable under the vast majority of federal grants. It's not a reimbursement program. We expect that the funds be expended during the grant period per se. Um, and not obligated before, and even not obligated before that period. So we do essentially, as I mentioned before, hold on to 90% of your funds, 10% can be used for planning and personnel. Tell the budget is the policy development condition is cleared by BJ. It's important to state that we don't approve your budget per se. We just take measures to assure that your budget is comprehensive and deliberate and compliant with state law. This is a three-year grant program, so your budget should be allocated to those three years. And then just as a general takeaway, the more you demonstrate an understanding of the full value of BWCs and address the core programmatic elements in your grant, the more competitive your solicitation will be. So you know, a robust and holistic application is important. Remember, you'll be competing against other agencies here. For categories three, four, and five, this is still a competitive grant program, even though there's no match. The awards are limited to law enforcement agencies, prosecutors' offices that have experience, have experience with BWC implementation and some with digital evidence management. So these are really demonstration projects intended to assist agencies to showcase, to move the needle on what they're doing and to showcase that information in a way that can be useful to other agencies endeavoring to do the same thing. Our TTA provider works with these agencies as well. Uh, we're just sort of cutting our teeth on this process. 2022 was the first year that we funded categories three, four, and five, but it's going well. And so agencies funded in 2023 will sort of join that community of practice. This again is a three-year grant program. There are allowances for extensions of grants, no cost extensions, uh, but I won't get into that uh, here. Agencies, again, should commit to working with the TTA provider for agencies three, four, and five, much like they do for categories one and two. It won't evolve as much around policy. TTA can 
be provided on policy issues if needed for categories three, four, and five. So here's what you should do, kind of the very brass tech logistics here is you are, if you haven't done this already, register with grants.gov. You have to get a unique entity identifier and a SAM number or make sure that your numbers are current. Then you need to register with grants.gov by April 4th at 8.59 Eastern time. You need to get into Just Grants and submit your application by April 11th at 8.59 p.m. There are links to the actual solicitation uh, for this program and list, uh, link to Just Grants below that. Uh, make sure you start early. Don't wait till the last minute to do these things. You may run into technical difficulties. There is a review process, but generally it's, you know, it's evident that you didn't allow enough time for those appeals for late submissions due to missing the grants.gov or the just grants deadline, the April 4th and April 11th deadline uh, would likely be rejected if you said, oh, you know, I signed on at eight o'clock and I couldn't get in, tried to get help and I couldn't get help. That's generally not going to fly. You should really leave ample time to do so. So applications, again, are, it's a two-stage process that started in 2022 when we moved over from our existing grants management system to just grants. Grants.gov is sort of the, the government-wide federal uh, grant application system in which you submit your SF-424, uh, that's a basic uh, administrative form that sort of um, is the masterhead or the, the cornerstone of your grant. And then the SFLLL, that's the closure of lobbying activity that's done in grants.gov, that's the April 4th deadline. And then the rest of your application uh, will be triggered by registering grants.gov and then that allow you to get into just grants and submit your application. Read the solicitation for much fuller guidance. Here's a basic checklist of everything you should do. I'll leave it up momentarily. There's a link on the solicitation itself for this checklist. Here are some resources you can use when applying for grants. This is a great new addition to Just Grants. So there's illustrated videos that take you through the process. Most of these here are short. There is an hour and a half sort of full-blown application mechanics for submitting an application. So some of the some of you who are absolutely new to the grant manage to grants, federal grants and to just grants may want to watch that and go back to your lessons about how to submit and to get basic understanding of the submission process of just grants. We encourage you to stay connected to OJP and BJA with these resources. Visit uh, BJA's website and drill down to find out about other funding opportunities and resources we provide. These are some important contact information for technical assistance with grants.gov and Just Grants and the OJP Response Center. All of this is listed in the solicitation itself. And there's some contact information, again, listed in the solicitation itself. That's my contact information on the bottom. Please use that reservedly. I am not the person to go to when you have technical challenges with grants.gov or just grants. I can and do provide sort of guidance on the substantive elements of the grants eligibility you know, to the extent that I can answer questions beforehand, uh, I tend to do that. But we do have a training and technical assistance provider, assistance provider that generally fields those questions Please, uh, pretty reservedly. Don't try to use them rather than coming to me. Now, I think we have maybe about eight minutes for questions and answers. And I see some queued up, um, and I think Brittany's going to help me. Uh, here. So we'll see how many of these we can get through. Yep. We have about 30 questions. We've answered some already, but we have about 30. So as John said, let's get through as many as we can, and then we will provide responses to everybody for those that, that we weren't able to get to yet. So the first one at the top, it states, our agency is currently two and a half years into a five-year contract where we have 100 BWCs but need 219 
be fully equipped. Our vendor has offered to start a new five-year grant for all 219 BWCs so, so that we can be on the same replacement life cycle. Would we be able to use grant funding to secure a new contract for all 219? Or because we already have 100, can we only apply for funding for the 119 that we do not already have? You can apply for funding for, for the full amount. We do allow for replacement or renewal of leases. Generally, we're prioritizing new or expansion programs. This sounds like it's a bit of an expansion and a bit of a renewal, which is fine, but keep in mind you'll be competing against agencies that are starting BWC programs fresh. So you still need to assure in your grant that provides the documentation and a compelling argument that you will be, um, that the agency will address all the programmatic elements of the grant and you know, improving agency operations, improving transparency and accountability, improving the uses, evidence. There's a lot packed into this question. I think one issue is the five-year contract. It, remember, it's a three-year grant period, so that might be have to be prorated. And then if you were looking to support, I think, 219 BWCs, 100 new and 100 replacements, uh, the body-worn camera metric would apply there. I'm not going to do the math there, but so there's a lot there. And unfortunately, we have not been able to extend this to a five-year grant program. We know that a lot of the vendors are going to five-year leases. Remember that the money needs to be expended during the grant period. So this is a question with a lot of detail in it. So hopefully I did justice to it. And, and if an uh, individual wants to reach out separately, we can address those questions. If we applied for a micro-grant, are we still eligible to apply for or with a partnering agency that's applying for BWC PIP? Yes, you can. So if you apply for a micro grant, let's say, and didn't receive it, or you're still waiting to receive it, nothing prevents you from applying from this grant. That's fine. Should you be awarded the BWC PIP grant, then probably you're going to accept that. And then should you be awarded the, the micro grant, then that would be waived. You wouldn't be awarded both. And how it would generally work, you know, who you're funded first by be who you'd be funded by. But if you did, if the case is that you, this agency had applied for a micro grant and didn't receive it, they're certainly eligible to apply on their own or with a partner for the BWC PIP grant. We're a small agency in Arkansas. Do we need to look for a partnership in our state? Not necessarily. I think that, you know, it, smaller agencies have to essentially and compete against larger agencies, so sometimes that economy scale is good. Should they be awarded, they have to adhere to all the requirements of the grant, including getting grant financial management training. So, you know, if there were a five-person municipal department that wanted to partner with a 50-person sheriff's office that is that has more resources and more grant experience, that would certainly be beneficial. But we don't limit smaller agencies applying. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, the reality is smaller agencies don't have the experience and the staff for grants often, but sometimes they do a great job and they, keep, they are competitive. If an SAA was to apply on behalf of other LEAs in the, LEAs in the state, would those LEAs need to be known at the time of application or could the SAA apply with an idea of how many agencies are like to provide a sub-grant but identify them later? Yeah, I, I alluded to that. I think that's a great question. Generally, for partnerships, you know, it's expected that the agencies are identified beforehand, but the SAA is, they're all experienced in grant management and they run their own grant management programs. So that would be allowable. I would just say that the application should provide some means of all those agencies will be selected, recruited to participate, um, and the rationale for the selection of those agencies, if they're not going to name them, they should really provide some sort of defensible rationale as to how they would select them. Would animal service officers fall under the umbrella of a local police department be eligible for the body-worn camera grant? Yes. Yeah, 
And provided they work for the law enforcement agency, body-worn cameras can be used, deployed to other than sworn personnel. Let me put it that way. So if it is a local, public, local publicly funded law enforcement agency and they want to deploy cameras to animal service officers, let's say they're, they've already got cameras for their patrol officers or for their sworn staff overall, and they want to expand to animal service officers, as long as they're a publicly funded law enforcement agency that is allowable, we've had agencies in the past expand their programs to include traffic enforcement personnel, for, for example. So that is allowable, yes. But if that agency were an animal service officers under an agency that didn't provide for law enforcement services, or the entity that would have the grant wouldn't be a law enforcement agency in that case. So uh, they would know, in this case, whether or not they're a law enforcement agency. The users of the body worn cameras can be non sworn personnel. Those users of the body worn cameras uh, don't have to be sworn officers, just clarifying. Okay. If every officer in our department is already equipped with body worn cameras, would our department be eligible to apply for the grant? We're currently looking to upgrade the cameras we have. I was looking at the slide that says type of program supported under categories one and two in program expansion that led me to believe eligibility would be for departments who have only partially implemented body worn cameras thus far. I think you know, that's generally the constituency we're speaking to is the use, the establishment or expansion of body worn cameras. We do allow for agencies where body worn cameras have sort of reached the end of their life cycle for upgrades, again, they would have to provide the compelling argument as to, to why those body worn cameras are necessary and how they're essential to enhance, enhancing the agency mission of being deployed in such a way that they're comprehensive and they, they meet all the programmatic elements. We don't prohibit those types of applications. Those are eligible. And then I just see the one question here, which is pretty easy to answer can you use the grant funds for both deputies and detention officers? Yes, and indeed we do have a number of sheriff's offices that have applied for and were successful in for programs that are using body worn cameras on the streets for patrol and enforcement, as well as in jail facilities. So that's allowable. I respect everybody's time. We will leave it at that. And we will be responding systematically to the whole host of questions that were addressed and submitting those to the group of participants. So with that, I want to thank uh, my colleagues at CNA. I want to thank you all for coming on what might have otherwise been time off. Uh, we will be recording this web. We have recorded this webinar. Uh, we will be making the slides available so you can go back and review. Uh, the webinar. Uh, we will have the answers to the questions in, in a reasonable time. Uh, so again, thank you and have a great rest of the week. And I wish you uh, great luck in writing your grant applications and submitting them to us.